Good morning. The committee will come to order. I would like to start by thanking all of our witnesses for coming today to participate in this important hearing. As the chair of the House Small Business Committee, I see every day how innovation and drive entrepreneurship. An important part of how we support American inventors is our patent system. Applying for and obtaining a patent allows small firms to gain access to capital, find licensing deals, and level the playing field with larger competitors, all of which lead to jobs and economic growth. However, women, minorities, and low-income individuals from urban and rural America are significantly underrepresented in the innovation ecosystem. The Institute for Women's Policy Research reported that in 2016, less than 20% of U.S. patents listed one or more women as investor, and under 8% listed a woman as the primary inventor. Research also reveals that only six patents per million were attributed to African-American inventors. Additionally, children who are born to high-income families are t 10 times more likely to obtain a patent than children from below median income families. This severe underrepresentation not only hurts these groups, but the economy as a whole. Reports show the U.S. GDP will grow by 4.6% if more women and minorities inventors were included in the patent system. This is particularly troubling for low-income communities and rural America that are already suffering from being on the wrong side of the digital divide. That is why this committee held a staff briefing on rural innovation to educate members of staff on the obstacle inventors and tech founders face in building innovation hubs in rural America. As the chairwoman of this committee, I am dedicated to ensuring that every corner of America has equal access to the patent system. Doing so is not only the right thing to do, it makes economic sense to harness the potential of all Americans to fully support innovation and competitiveness. During today's hearing, we will hear from experts on barriers to entry in the patent system, how we can craft pub public policy to increase diversity and other challenges facing women and minorities in STEM heavy industries. One way to improve the intellectual property system is gathering better information on who is applying for patents. Thanks to the leadership of the ranking member, Mr. Shabot, his le legislation, the Success Act, required the USPTO to look at the participation of women, minorities, and veterans in the patent system. That bill and its report were a great first step. However, a key finding was that there is a limited amount of publicly available data regarding the participation rates of women, minorities, and veterans. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And this lack of research and reporting on patent applicant demographic data makes it difficult for policymakers to advance legislation that will foster inclusive innovation. I have mentioned many times that nearly 85% of SBA loan applicants voluntarily fill out the demographic data that is collected by SBA. This provides the committee with valuable insight regarding the small businesses utilizing the SBA for access to capital. The IDEA Act, which I introduced earlier this Congress, built on the, on the Success Act by collecting patent applicant demographic data on a voluntary basis at the application stage and directing the USPTO to produce reports. Collecting and reporting this valuable information will drive better policy and help close the patent gap faced by women, minorities, and others. It will also provide insights so that we can make smart, targeted investments to increase the pool of investors and entrepreneurs.
At the same time, we must also address some of the barriers many Americans have obtaining patents in the current system, including increased diversity in venture capital and the tech industry, robust support for women and minority in STEM education, and congressional support of the SBIR program. Today, women receive just 2.2% of venture capital, and under 3% of venture-backed founders were black and Latino. Further, women hold less than 20% of U.S. tech jobs, and only 5% are in position of leadership at technology companies. Similarly, African Americans hold less than 15% of tech positions, and Latino 14%. Clearly, more must be done to increase diversity. Supporting STEM education and the SBA's SBIR program are two other important ways to address the lack of diversity in the technology sector. Studies show that 75% of girls who have participated in hands-on STEM activities are empowered to seek careers in technology, while government programs like SBIR have made strides to foster participation by women and minorities through the National Road Show. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses and working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to create meaningful policies that foster more opportunities for all Americans to innovate, seek patent protection for their inventions, and reap the benefits of entrepreneurship. I now would like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this important uh, meeting today. Uh, today, as you indicated, the committee will address uh, the need for increased diversity in uh, U.S. patents. Intellectual property, IP, plays a vital role in protecting creative and innovative products and ideas. Our nation's small businesses represent about 96 percent of employer firms in manufacturing industries with a high number of patents. Studies show that small business owners with IP protections can earn over 30 percent more in revenue compared to their counterparts who have none. Firms with IP rights also pay, on average, 20 percent more in wages. The process for obtaining these protections can be challenging. Some small business owners are not even aware that they should protect their innovative products and ideas with intellectual property protections. In the last Congress, I was involved in helping to get the Success Act passed. Um, this law became the starting point for this hearing and gave the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office the opportunity to collaborate with the SBA in order to study and reach recommendations for how to better include women and minorities in entrepreneurship and patent activities. Today, we will hear from a panel of very distinguished uh, witnesses uh, who will help us think about what the next steps should be uh, in ensuring that uh, there is patent diversity. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, what we can do to foster America's creative small businesses moving forward. Again, we want to thank all our panel members for being here this morning. Look forward to their testimony and asking questions, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. The gentleman yields back, and if committee members have an opening statement, we would ask that they be submitted uh, for the record. I would like to just take a few minutes to explain the timing rules. Each witness gets five minutes to testify, and members get five minutes for questioning. There is a lighting system to assist you. The green light comes on when you begin, and the yellow light means there is one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you are out of time, and we ask that you... Uh, stay within the time frame to the best of your ability. I would now like to introduce our witnesses on today's first panel. Our first witness today is Ms. Andrea Ippolito. Uh, Ms. Ippolito, Ippolito currently serves as Executive Director of Engineering Management Program and creator of W.E. Cornell at Cornell University, which works to increase the number of women in Cornell 
STEM-based entrepreneurship program. Prior to joining Cornell, she served as the director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Innovators Network within the VA Center for Innovation. In this capacity, Ms. Polito designed and oversaw the creation of a $10.5 million program that provides tools and resources to VA employees to develop innovations that improve, improve the experience of our veterans. Ms. Polito pursued doctoral studies in the Engineering System Division at MIT and also completed her MS in Engineering and Management at MIT. Welcome. Our second witness is Dr. Roshan Ray. Dr. Ray, a David uh, Rubinstein Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, is Associate Professor of Sociology and Executive Director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Ray's research addresses the mechanism that manufacture and maintain racial and social inequality. Dr. Ray has published over 50 books, articles, and book chapters, and nearly 20 of its on the intersection of race, gender, and work. Welcome. Our third witness is Ms. Yania uh, Griffin. Ms. Griffin is founder and CEO of the Commercializer, a strategic consulting firm that collaborates with entrepreneurs and institutions to bring ideas and talents to fruition in increased economic growth opportunities. Focusing on technology, entrepreneurship, and inclusive innovation, Ms. Griffin is an experienced business development strategist, assisting a range of clients from small business owners to historically black colleges and universities to underserved community organizations. Welcome. And now I yield to the ranking member for, uh, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our final witness will be Rick Wade, who is the Vice President of Strategic Alliances and Outreach at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Previously, he worked with the Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration and the Minority Business Development Agency. Before joining the chamber, he was the Deputy Chief of Staff to former Secretary of Commerce Gary Locke and a member of the White House Interagency Task Force on Federal Contracting Opportunities for Small Businesses. He received his BS from the University of South Carolina, an MPA from Harvard University, and was awarded honorary doctorates from Benedict College and from South Carolina State University. We welcome you here uh, this morning, Mr. Wade. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Ms. Polito, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Velazquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and all members of the committee for inviting me to speak here today. I'm incredibly honored to be here as a citizen, biomedical engineer, entrepreneur, and faculty member at Cornell University. At Cornell, I focus my teaching efforts on cultivating women entrepreneurs in the sciences, where I serve as a lecturer in the College of Engineering and SC Johnson College of Business. I also direct a program called Women Entrepreneurs Cornell, or WE Cornell, the Center for Regional Economic Advancement, a hub at Cornell for several entrepreneurship programs. In my testimony, I will focus on the challenges facing women in obtaining patents. However, the challenges I'll talk about today also apply to minority groups and are often felt even more acutely by men and women of color. Today, women make up just 12% of all patent inventors. If we continue business as usual, it will take an estimated 116 years to reach gender parity in patenting. This is not an acceptable status quo. Innovation is the cornerstone of our economy. We need to be bringing more and diverse people into the innovation ecosystem to remain competitive on the global stage. The USPTO says, if women, minorities, and low-income individuals were to invent patented technology at the same rate as white men from high-income households, the rate of innovation in America would quadruple. Now let's take a look at the barriers. It's important to note up front that many of the barriers facing women in the patenting process are the same obstacles that women battle in the workplace at large. Systemic gender discrimination and lack of access to institutional resources in mentoring in the right fields. Women are actually making significant gains in STEM fields and entrepreneurship, participating in these fields at greater rates than ever before. And at Cornell University, 50% of all undergraduate engineering students are women. 
However, the growing number of women in STEM fields has not translated to increases in female patent inventors. But getting more women into STEM fields is not enough. The real gap comes from the rate of women involved in patent intensive fields, such as electrical and mechanical engineering. We also see far fewer women seeking patents in private industry than in the academic sector. Given that 85% of patents go to private industry, this presents a challenge to gender parity. So why this gap? The existing research suggests that a lack of exposure to women in patent producing fields is a key cause of sluggish growth in female innovation. Basically, it's a vicious cycle. A lack of women in these fields mean a lack of mentors, role models, and sponsors for aspiring women inventors seeking guidance and resources to innovate. Speaking from personal experience, my mother was an electrical engineer and constantly exposed me to STEM fields growing up. Her example created a pathway for me, which I hope to pass on to my daughter, who is here with me today. If we're serious about raising the rates of women filing for and obtaining patents, we need to focus more resources on creating pathways to innovation and patenting for individuals and the academic sector, and by bringing more women into patent-intensive fields. Part of creating that pathway is addressing the high cost of patenting. The cost of patenting can range from $5,000 to $20,000, depending on the complexity of the technology. For individuals, the cost almost always falls directly on the inventor. The cost is often a heavier burden for women inventors due to continued gender wage disparity and lack of access to venture capital or seed stage investment. Note that just 2% of venture capital in the US goes to women-only founders. Women also bear a disproportionate share of the responsibilities for child rearing, and they point to childcare costs as a key barrier to pursuing patents. A 2011 study found that patenting rates for women academics with children are lower than men and women faculty without children, and male academics actually increase patent activity with parenthood. Now, there are a few ways we can start to address the barriers facing women in the patenting process. First, the federal government should consider directing resources to establishing programs that provide on-ramps dedicated to increasing women's and minority group exposure to the patent and commercialization process. These resources should be directed to sectors in which women are currently pursuing patents, such as the academic sector, as well as for bringing women into patent-intensive fields. Specifically, we recommend that the SBA and USPTO consider a joint initiative which would create funds for on-ramp programs that focus on women and minorities. Second, these on-ramp programs should be feeders to existing entrepreneurship initiatives in the university, community, or region, such as the NSF i program, among others. And third, we need to address the cost of applying for a patent. Tailored programs and entrepreneurship initiatives should consider specific funding for patent support to cover the cost of applying for patents and hiring the appropriate legal counsel. In conclusion, let's tackle this together to bring untapped talent into the innovation sphere and support more equitable and just economic prosperity across our nation. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Polito. Dr. Ray, now you recognize for five minutes. Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and distinguished members of the Committee on Small Business, thank you for inviting me to testify on enhancing patent diversity for America's innovators. I'm currently a David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution and an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland. I'm also the Executive Director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research. At LASER, what we do is we regularly partner with government agencies, organizations, and corporations to conduct objective research evaluations and develop innovative research products such as our virtual reality work with law enforcement and incarcerated people. My comments will primarily focus on uh, the importance of collecting data. What are public attitudes? How do people behave? And why is it important to collect demographic data? A majority of, Ameri of Americans want to be in control of who collects data on them, what is collected, for how long that data are stored, and what the data will be used for. However, context matters. For example, 90% of Americans view their social security number as very sensitive, whereas only 8% view their purchasing habits as being very sensitive. About 80% of Americans report having awareness that the government collects information on their verbal, written, and online communication. And people seem to be quite comfortable with credit card companies collecting and storing data on them, followed closely by the government. They are much less likely, however, to be comfortable with websites they visit online, as well as cable and cell phone companies. 
Over 50 percent of Americans think that the government should be able to store data for a few years or as long as they need to. At the same time, however, slightly less than one third of Americans perceive the government will keep their data safe and private. This is comparable to views about cell phone companies and cable companies. Partly, this simply has to do with a decline in public trust in social institutions. However, the public is much more likely to trust science and medicine than other social institutions. So, do people actually voluntarily provide demographic information on a survey when asked? In short, yes. My experience collecting data is that people overwhelmingly answer demographic questions on surveys. I conducted surveys and interviews with the general public, police officers, students, families, parents, employees of companies, members of religious organizations, um, protesters and march attendees, people who have lost large amounts of weight, people living in urban, suburban, and rural areas, people on the West Coast, the South, East Coast, um, as well as the Midwest and other high-risk groups. I've conducted these surveys and interviews in person, online, on paper, and on tablets and other smart devices. I've asked demographic questions verbally too, and the response rate is similar. Generally, I've asked respondents a, an assortment of questions ranging from uh, questions about police-civilian relationships to sexual assault on campus to issues uh, with family and relationships. And overwhelmingly, people still voluntarily provide demographic information. I typically ask an assortment of questions um, about demographics, gender, age, race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, education level, household income, military or veteran status, and disability. I've also asked people who live in their household what their relationship um, is to these people as well as people's political and religious beliefs. In this regard, demographic data encompasses a host of factors well beyond race or gender. By collecting other factors, it gives researchers the ability to conduct statistical analyses to determine what other factors matter in a survey. In a typical survey, less than 5% of respondents refuse to answer demographic questions. I'm also the co-editor of an academic publication, Context Magazine, Sociology for the Public. And no matter how obscure the topic, rarely do researchers report having difficulty getting respondents to answer demographic questions. Um, I want to end with three points about why it's important to collect demographic data. First, more data are normally better because they help to eliminate false positives. For example, the lack of demographic data may inflate the likelihood of certain groups catching a deadly disease, having an early onset of dementia, or even whether or not they receive a patent or not, um, how many times they had to apply to receive a patent, and then what impact that patent might actually have on their economic growth. Second, um, oh, and the other thing, these false positives may inadvertently funnel resources to the wrong areas. So by not including demographic areas, we might be misplacing resources and efficiencies. Second, the collection of demographic data allows for the determination of whether or not a sample is representative. Representation is extremely, extremely key, whether or not we're talking about people living in urban or rural areas, whether or not we're talking about across different demographic groups, veteran status, disability, et cetera. So if a researcher is conducting a study on vaccines, for example, a representative sample is paramount. And I think everyone knows that there's kind of a history of this legacy here of what happens when you don't have a representative sample. If there's an over or under representation of certain groups, the analysis will then likely over or underestimate the impact of, say, in this case, vaccines and other sort of outcomes. I also study algorithms, and we've seen that uh, recently as well, the impact that that can have in the medical sphere. Third, what most Americans desire more than anything is transparency, inclusion, and equity. Demographic data help to provide this. A lack of demographic data often leads to bad science, does a disservice to Americans, and inhibits the United States' ability in continuing to be innovative and comprehensive. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And Ms. Griffin, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Chabot, and members of the committee, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss increasing diversity within our patent and commercialization system. I am honored to be here with you today. My name is Jenea Griffin, the commercializer. I'm an advocate for intellectual property. The first time that I truly learned about the value of patents was not in grade school or even college, not in history books that were part of any common core curriculum that I was taught. It was only after college when I met professors who had patents, who looked like me, did I believe that it was possible to obtain one. Before becoming an advocate for IP, I was a STEM graduate from Gramlin State University. The dean of my college recognized the entrepreneur in me and encouraged me to apply for a fellowship program called the Integrated Technology Transfer Network. 
Funded by the Department of Navy through earmarks, it took STEM students from HBCUs and taught us the business side of things so we could speak and understand the technical language, then translate that into a value proposition that business people could understand. Unfortunately, that program was defunded in 2011. By receiving certification in entrepreneurial technology commercialization, I was able to learn the true value and functionality of IP and work on tech transfer projects from several federal labs where I evaluated patents to determine their commercial potential. Today, I manage and sell NASA's IP. Having said that, I am a black woman with a very unique skill set and only have the knowledge about the patent commercialization system because I went through a very specialized program that targeted STEM students from HBCUs. This program was created, this program has created inventors, small business owners, and even directors of SBA funded programs. The advocacy work I do for innovators of color allows me to speak to what I see may be the issues that the country's patent and commercialization process is facing. My story about patents is not unique. I have surveyed my colleagues, clients, and professionals within this space, and the sentiments are mostly the same. Many of them, even those who are patent attorneys, only learned about the value of IP when they reached grad school or as they were assigning their ownership rights to their IP over to their soon-to-be employer. Research shows black inventors receive six patents per million people compared to 235 of their white counterparts. So if you combine 13 of the nation's NFL stadiums, only six of those seats were for black people. It is clear that even with the invention of the internet, there are still huge exposure gaps in education when it comes to people of color seeing the contributions of people that look like them in the history books we are learning from. We should be highlighting and elevating inventors such as Marion Croak, a black woman with almost 200 patents, who has a proven track record of success in this field to serve as a nationwide ambassador for patent attainment. The diversity gap in, in patents is not just an inclusion issue. It's also an exposure to generational wealth through patent commercialization and access issue. And if exposure to generational wealth can be passed down through generations, then so can exposure to generational trauma. Before we begin to think we can solve the diversity gap, we must first understand how it came to be. For decades, our country's laws have placed minorities in positions where they have had to choose their life over their IP, even at one point being considered property themselves. Economist Dr. Lisa Cooks discusses the correlation of declining minority patents during the Jim Crow and race riot era, having lost over 1,000 patents. More than 100 years prior, in 1710, the same holds true. The Meritorious Manumission Act of Virginia gave slave owners the rights to grant their slaves freedom in exchange for their invention. Hence, the systemic issues faced by minorities in the patent commercialization systems for decades has not only created the diversity gap, but has continued to sustain it. How can we expect to increase diversity in patenting and commercialization if historically the system has not been built for minorities to participate or succeed in general? Only collecting vanity metrics such as demographics of the inventor is not going to close the diversity gap. In fact, we should be we should be asking how many of those six patents per million people are actually small business owners. As ownership of a patent by a small business generates 16 new jobs, that's 16 more opportunities for minorities and returning citizens. The success of this great nation is not only dependent on our ability to invest in proven programs, pathways, and institutions which make room for a greater number of inventors, but also on how we tell the true story of the contributions of women and minorities in almost every sector of the American economy. Why not fund more certificate programs like the one I went through. If we are truly focused on increasing, increasing the diversity of patents, we must invest in education, access, and equity at the highest level in the most marginalized communities, which will ensure this great nation retains its economic vitality. My name is Janae Griffin, an HBC graduate, IP advocate, and a proud black woman. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Wade. Good morning, Chair, Woman, and members. I am Rick Wade, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Vice President for Strategic Alliances and Outreach. I'm leading our efforts to create and expand opportunities for diverse-owned businesses and enterprises across America. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, before you this morning. The Chamber commends the committee for its leadership on issues central to increasing access to our innovation economy, particularly among women, minorities, veterans, and other underserved communities. Through my experience both in the public and private sectors, I've come to understand and appreciate that diverse owned enterprises are key contributors to and drivers of America's economy. The Minority Business Development Agency, MBDA, of the U.S. Department of Commerce 
estimates that there are currently 11 million minority business enterprises nationwide, which employ over 6 million people and generate nearly $1.8 trillion in revenue. Enhanced access to tools like the patent system will only strengthen these enterprises and ensure their competitiveness in years to come. We especially appreciate the committee's work on the study of underrepresented classes chasing engineering and science success act of 2018, also known as the success act. Too often undeserved communities and diverse business owners lack the information and or resources to take advantage of the many forms of intellectual property protections available to them, including our US patent system. As you well know, the Success Act directed the United States Patent and Trademark Office in consultation with the Small Business Administration to identify publicly available data on the number of patents applied for and obtained by women minority veterans and benefits of increasing these numbers. The Act also asked for legislative recommendations on how to encourage and increase engagement among diverse innovators and entrepreneurs. We recognize the leadership of USPTO Director Andre Ayinku for the report and programs that his agency ha has implemented to encourage more diverse participation in our innovation economy. The USPTO report revealed that there is limited amount of public available data regarding the level of participation by women, minorities, and veterans. Only approximately 12% of investors named on U.S. patents are women. Clearly, this represents a serious issue of concern, but also an opportunity, as minority communities have higher shares of women-owned enterprises. The USPTO has resources in almost every state to help new entrants navigate the patent process, including local partnerships with pro bono attorneys, law school clinic programs, local libraries, where inventors can get help searching USPTO databases for previously filed patents and trademarks and other programs. The USPTO also recently updated its homepage to include a link to these local resources. Now with just one click, new inventors can access a map of the United States and then click on their states and find in one place numerous resources to assist them in their local areas. This year, the USPTO will launch a Council for Innovation and Inclusiveness to develop a national strategy for promoting and increasing the participation of underrepresented groups. It will expand its work with other federal agencies to develop training materials to help elementary, middle, and high school teachers incorporate the concepts of invention and IP creation and protection into classroom instruction. The report also provides legislative recommendations. Congress could authorize a streamlined mechanism for USPTO to undertake a voluntary confidential biennial survey of individuals named in patent applications that have been filed. Congress could expand the authorized uses of grants and funds in, in appropriate federal programs to include activities that promote innovation and entrepreneurship among underrepresented groups. Finally, please know that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the largest business organization in the world, has stepped up its efforts to expand opportunities for diverse-owned enterprises. Our partnership with the Minority Business Development Agency, in which we are working together to address issues such as innovation, automation, access to capital, and connectivity to the global marketplace. We're convening the heads of na the nation's diverse chambers and other business organizations to collectively advocate for a common business agenda to include entrepreneurship. Our next-gen partnership with historically black colleges and universities seek to inspire and develop the next generation of innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. Through a grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, we're advancing a dialogue across the business community on Kellogg's major research report, The Business Case for Racial Equity, assessing best practices and policies that can help close the entrepreneurial divide. From Thomas Jennings, the first black patent recipient in 1821 for a dry, dry cleaning process, to current day Dr. Lonnie Johnson, who's literally a rocket scientist, our goal must be to continue to inspire and develop new generations of innovation, innovators and entrepreneurs. We look forward to working with you and walking with you on this very important journey. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, quite an impressive uh, group of witnesses, and uh, we really thank you for providing such insightful uh, information. Uh, Doctor, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Dr. Ray, in the Success Act report, we found that there was little to no available uh, data concerning the number of women and minority inventors who have applied 
for or receive patents from the USPTO. And we also know that we need to improve patent opportunities for all underserved entrepreneurs, including those in rural community. How does this lack of data impact Congress' ability to propose legislation that will improve opportunity for underrepresented groups? Yeah, well, uh, a lack of data might actually lead to a misallocation of funds or a misplacement of funds. And, and it might also be about kind of an intersection between, say, race, gender, and geography. So what you might find, as we know, is that there's an underrepresentation for women <coughs> and minorities, but it might be that individuals are living in particular areas. And if we don't capture these variety of demographic questions, we won't be able to answer these important questions. So do you think it is important that we collect uh, information to track regional patterns of in, uh, innovation? Yes, I do. I mean, geography becomes a, a key metric by which to look at. In fact, uh, in a lot of research studies, zip code is oftentimes used as a proxy for income, wealth, and race. And so if we're collecting that information, we want to make sure that we collect an assortment of these demographic variables because a proxy can be just as detri detrimental as not collecting information. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Hippolito, uh, there are significantly, and you mentioned that, more women participating in science and engineering occupations and entrepreneurship. But yet, this has not translated into more female patent holders. I heard when you say the high cost of patent. But do you believe that there are any other efforts needed to ensure that a more robust uh, pipeline of women in STEM leads to equality in the innovation economy? Absolutely. So we recommend that the USPT we recommend that the USPTO and SBA uh, ignite new programs to create on-ramp programs, taking STEM women and other minorities to introduce them to patenting commercialization processes. And in these programs, they will get exposed to role models and mentors. Uh, there was a recent study that was done by Dr. Delgado and Dr. Murray uh, that shows that patents from top inventors have higher percentages of including first-time female inventors on their patents. What's interesting about this work is that these top inventors are are both male and female. Um, but in particular, female top inventors tend to include more women. Mm -hmm. So how do we include these top inventors as part of these on-ramp programs, as role models, as mentors, to help facilitate this process? And what's great about these on-ramp programs, we Cornell being one of them. At what level that should happen? So they should be based in universities and in communities. Universities are the places where STEM women and minorities are being educated. So this is a great opportunity to expose them at that level so that they can continue innovating beyond the university setting. Ms. Griffin, would you like to comment on this same point? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, I do um, agree with uh, Ms. Ippolito's um, sentiments. Um, specifically, minority-serving institutions and HBCUs graduate the most mm -hmm. uh, minorities that we know today. So um, by working directly with them, um, I think that would be the best bet. And what would you say is uh, one of the biggest reasons many minority entrepreneurs fail to receive patents? So I'll give you three. Education, lack of education um, in terms of the patenting and commercialization process, mm -hmm. um, lack of resources, and then also the lack of access. So if we're looking in terms of like representation on um, how many inventors um, we're, we're looking at through our, our history books, um, which is kind of what I talked about before. Um, we don't really see too many of them, and it's not something that is widely known, and so we need that representation. There's so many people that I talked to that actually didn't know anything about the patent process, thank you, anything about the patent process um, until they reached graduate school. So if you think about um, the many patents, especially um, Dr. Croak, she has 200 patents. So anytime before then, if she would have been educated as a child in her early childhood years, 200 patents from her graduate school years until now, we, we, are, we have lost so much economic um, opportunity from that position. Um, there's also culturally um, 
we need more culturally competent, qualified counsel. Um, and so by working with them, they would um, allow us to be able to educate um, our minorities and uh, marginalized communities. Thank you. My time has expired, and now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Chabot. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Hippolito, um, in your view, what's the biggest barrier for women uh, who are trying to enter the patent uh, process, and what can we do to help? So the two biggest barriers are exposure, <laughs> our exposure, and also the high cost of patenting. Uh, so we know that there's a growing number of STEM women that are entering this field and they're going out into the private sector. By the way, there's an overwhelming number of patents coming from the private sector, particularly in patent intensive fields like electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. So the biggest barrier is getting exposure to these STEM women who we know are um, getting this education, but we're not efficiently using that talent talent pool. And so if we can direct resources, programs like the ones the panels have talked about to educate mm -hmm. them and expose them, uh, show them role models, uh, you can't be what you can't see. And so we need to bring this exposure to K through 12 programs and university settings. And then we need to address the high cost of patenting itself uh, with pro bono lawyers that are mm -hmm. qualified in those fields. Mm -hmm. And we need to give them access to these networks of lawyers to help them facilitate this process. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me go back to uh, Mr., uh, Dr. Wade, if I could, or Mr. Wade, sorry. Um, in, in your written uh, statement, you would discuss the Chamber's annual international IP index. Are there any trends that the Chamber sees that could uh, either be beneficial or non-beneficial for the U.S. in coming years? Well, the, the IP index, uh, the intellectual property index, which measures economies across some 50 countries, I mean, what it does is shows a correlation between intellectual property protections, patents, uh, a, a job creation and success and growth of business. That has been a consistent trend and the, probably the most important trend that I think should be the basis of, of even this conversation. How do we increase uh, 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 entrepreneurs and innovators across diverse community, communities so as to create more jobs and create to the positive forces of our economy? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ray, in your opinion, um, why do Americans give so much uh, uh, their, their, you know, the demographic uh, data so easily to, to surveyors? Are there any risks that come with that and uh, any, anything that you would suggest uh, along those lines? Because obviously yeah. you're legitimate. How, how should people make sure that they're not uh, being tricked into something? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I, I think when people know why they're giving their information, they are much more likely to give it. So I think when it comes to the federal government, when it becomes clear why that information is being provided, people provide it. The surveys that I've done for all of the, the slew of publications I've had, I tell people, um, in fact, it's required at, at universities to do research that we tell people why we're collecting data on them and what we're going to use it for. And typically people will do that. I think one of the other things that's extremely important is to capture the most people at the most, most time. So in this particular case, at the application phase is when you're going to get them. Because, I mean, if people don't get the patent, they're going to be less likely to fill out a survey later, they're not as incentivized. But if you get that demographic information from the beginning, then people are much more likely to provide it. And I think it's commonplace. I think in many regards, if we're talking about gender, age, um, even household income, geography, race, mm -hmm. typically people can, can pinpoint what a person looks like. And they, even, even if people's age is slightly off by, by 10 years or so, people kind of have an idea of what those demographics are and people are willing to provide them. Thank you very much. Um, and Ms. Griffin, um, could you uh, could you tell us uh, something about uh, you talked about the various patents that you've been involved in? Is there any one in particular that that you have that was particularly you think might be helpful or uh, help other people out there who might have a, a great idea and want to get a patent for themselves uh, to either support their family or their business down the route line or whatever? You're asking me if I have an actual patent? Yeah, I mean, did you? No, I okay, didn't. You haven't yourself. Okay, didn't were there anything that you were engaged in or worked with that you think are particularly interesting or that give some information to folks that might have a good idea out there? Um, patents in particular? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there are, oh wow, a lot of different technologies, um, specifically ones that are um, focused on actually solving the problems within their communities. Mm -hmm. So most times what I see with when I'm working with people is that um, they're solving a problem that has been specifically affected by them um, and most people that they know. So people solve problems that, you know, affect themselves. And so um, I think that specifically when we're talking about women, um, issues that women's fit that women's face, like um, I'm sorry, issues that women's face. Um, there are many times where um, there should be issues where marginalized communities are really being focused on. And so um, if we're talking about um, artificial intelligence, if we're talking about different ways that we can use technologies to be incorporated into businesses that may not actually have patents or may not have a technical person there, um, they should be able to use like federal labs or institutions that actually have repositories of patents um, in order to become either tech enabled or tech based. Um, we are are now currently in our fourth industrial revolution and so technology is at the core of that and so if entrepreneurs and small business owners are not putting technologies into their business um, owning their own patents um, we're losing out on jobs lost we're losing out on being able to be a part of the economy that is now being created today thank you very much my time's expired madam chair time has expired um, me, the gentle lady from kansas miss davis is recognized for five minutes uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, uh, to the Chairwoman and Ranking Member, thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, I, I say this all the time, small business is the backbone of, um, of our country, and I think what we're talking about now is seeing uh, small business uh, being impacted by innovation and being able to own um, the intellectual property uh, when, when, when you're the creator. And... Um, this past October, the House passed the Women's um, Women's Business Center Im Improvement Act, and uh, Rep. Hagedorn and I uh, put that bill forward because women's business centers, uh, we think, can have uh, a really strong impact on um, entrepreneurship and supporting women entrepreneurs. Um, I'm going to start... Uh, I have at least one more question, so ho hopefully we'll get the, through this quickly. Uh, Ms. Ippolito, uh, I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit, because you mentioned um, WBCs um, in your testimony, if you could talk a little bit about how um, programs like yours or other programs can help um, feed in, either feed into uh, women's business centers or um, maybe how women's business centers can I improve to, to maybe partner with, with the types of programs that you have. Absolutely. So at Cornell, we created Women Entrepreneurs of Cornell, or we Cornell, to act as a feeder into our existing entrepreneurship initiatives. And the reason we did that is because we didn't want to cannibalize the number of women in our entrepreneurship programs. We wanted to increase the number of women and minorities in our programs. So programs like We Cornell that we see at other universities as well, um, but we hope programs like We Cornell can scale across the country in university-based settings, in particular in areas outside of our technology bubbles that we often see on the coast. But programs like We Cornell can partner um, with the Women Business Centers to increase exposure of STEM women to these services. If you build it, you cannot just assume they will come. Women need to be invited, encouraged, um, and inspired, frankly, to be part of this movement so that we can have a better economy. So programs like We Cornell can partner with Women Business Centers, and we can have directed outreach uh, to STEM women and minorities in these programs. Um, so that actually, so Ms. Griffin, in your uh, written and um, uh, verbal uh, testimony, you mentioned the program, the Integrated Technology Transfer Network program mm -hmm. that you participated in, um, and that you didn't really see this type of opportunity until much uh, later. And I'm curious how uh, the how we can talk about getting folks um, more knowledgeable, interested, excited about these kinds of, uh, about STEM, about uh, patents earlier on, um, and not just, uh, not just when, when folks get to that college 
um, that college level. And then secondarily, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about how I don't know if you're familiar with the Women's Business Centers or um, some of the other SBA programs, but how those might um, partner with like HBCUs. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear that as well. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have to meet them where they are. Um, and most times when we're talking about marginalized communities, they know nothing about what's going on outside of where they live, right? Um, and so if we are to educate them on um, who they could be, we have to show them people that look like them that are actually doing it, um, which is why I talked about Dr. Croak. I keep bringing her up again because we need to actually see people um, that look like us to actually put it in place where we actually believe that it can happen. Um, because it's a tangible thing. Um, the Integrated Technology Transfer Network program was a really great program and it opened up my eyes to a lot of different things. Um, I didn't know anything about technology transfer offices. Um, I didn't know that um, many HBCUs don't necessarily have them or know uh, what to do about technology transfer. Um, because once actually after I graduated, I went back to my HBCU and I said, hey, where's our tech transfer office? I'm thinking that this is something that is common um, because we were at Cal State University San Bernardino um, and they didn't know what I was talking about. Um, and so for me, I think the education around technology commercialization um, and technology transfer, because you're looking at it from a standpoint of having either corporations or institutions that are actually licensing these technologies that are resulting from um, federal funds versus small business owners who are actually spending their hard-earned money and investments into um, into patenting prosecution fees and things of that nature. So I think those are two very um, different things. And when we want to talk about licensing for small business owners, um, they are actually re being able to exploit and reap most of those benefits by um, gaining residual income from that. Time has expired. Thank you. Now we recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Berche. Thank you, Chair Lady, Ranking Member. Um, thank you all for putting this meeting together, as was stated earlier. Um, I've always been an inventor at heart. I still make um, uh, bamboo skateboards, actually, bamboo and hemp, actually, and I'm completely biodegradable. Everybody thinks I'm going to break my neck on them, but I still ride them, and much to the chagrin of my neighbors and my wife. But anyway, um, and I appreciate y'all being here. Ma'am, I appreciate you bringing your daughter here. I had a very cool mama, and um, she actually flew an airplane during the Second World War. She was quite a lady and I miss her daily. And while Daddy was off fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, my mama did her part for the war effort. And so I was blessed. And ma'am, uh, when you mentioned historically black colleges, my mama taught for 10 years at Knoxville College and was in their Hall of Fame, actually, so that's cool. And you men, I ain't got nothing for y'all today. I, <laughs> I dig y'all being here, but I, I especially appreciate the ladies, and I thank you again for bringing your daughter here with you. I, have a wonderful little girl who I got when she was um, was five and uh, started dating her mama then and, and I adopted her since then. It's never made more money, never been broker, and never been happier in my entire life. So thank you all. Um, but it, it, this really doesn't have anything to do with what you all have said, but a, a fellow was in my office this week when I'd met earlier, oddly enough, and we were talking about inventions and he, he invented something that was really cool and it got stolen from him, went to court, got it back, but I'm wondering if you all, any of y'all have ever heard of um, anybody ha has an approved patent, but they haven't been able to main the patent or maintain it because a larger company stole their idea. I hear a lot of that from China. Thank you, ma'am. Um, but I, I was wondering if any of y'all could name any specifics real fast. Sir, we'll start with you on the end and just come this way. I, 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 can't. I, probably, I can't cite any specific examples. I'd be happy to follow up. Okay, I would like that, ma'am. So I won't get into specifics because I don't know what is public information, but I have spoken with uh, a few people who have um, have those same sentiments that they do feel like um, corporations are, you know, once they have presented that information to them, they basically say that they're not interested and then they see something, whether it's in the marketing that they shared or something that is not um, uh, in their claims, right? So they be they begin to use the funds that they do have access to to develop around the claims that are in those patents. And then when you're looking at um, an independent patent inventor, um, 
they don't necessarily have those funds to actually fight in litigation and to go up against big corporations. And so there's nothing that they can do. Um, I mean, outside of just coming to legislation, um, talking to the congressman or congresswoman. Right. But yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'll quickly say, I mean, Lonnie Johnson, who we mentioned before, who pre pretty much every kid has played with a Nerf gun or a super soaker. Um, I mean, he actually had to litigate and go to court because and the patents actually helped to preserve that for him. Um, and I think that's what's key is that it's a long and toward history of particularly individuals who are under resourced women and minorities having their inventions stolen from them. I mean, historically, I mean, Jack Daniels is, is one of those examples with uh, with Uncle Nearest. And they they've tried to amend from that. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, by the way. Thank you. So um, I so, appreciate so, the uh, fact that you and I are the only people in this dadgum room that don't have an accent. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I could go along with that. Thank but you, um, but I mean, I think that there are several in individuals and I think to this point, Point, that impacts the application process. And that's why it's important to collect data on the front end because you have a lot of individuals who simply will opt out of that process because of the money and because they're worried about getting scooped from large companies. Thank you, ma'am. So I don't have any specifics from personal experience, but in speaking with folks that have gone through the patent process and that are repeat offenders, and I use that in a positive way of those that are applying for more than one patent, they hear these stories. And to Dr. Ray's point, if they learn and hear of their colleagues and peers um, that have to go to court and litigate, which sometimes it can cost up to a couple hundred thousand dollars, if not more, then this deters them from submitting more patents. So I think we need to fix this. I believe there is a group of inventors that have the Inventors' Right Act, and there's a lot of talk in this arena from inventors that I've spoken with. You know, I feel like we're the dadgum Congress. We ought to do better by working folks that come up with these innovative ideas, because I hear about them getting stolen. I know this lady back here, I, I appreciate that. I've heard it many times. So thank you all. One quick question. i got 17 seconds. Ms. Griffin, where would you suggest folks go to obtain funding for their patents? Banks? Um, independent inventors, I think we're here. <laughs> they should come here. <laughs> uh, well, no. So if we're looking at funding that has also, that has already been allocated um, to help small business owners, why are we not looking at allocating more funding to actually help them within the patent ownership process? Um, data shows that small business owners who actually own their patents generate 16 jobs. Um, their sales go up 51% over five years. And so if we are wanting to help small business owners, then we need to help them in the ownership of their patents and be able to help them exploit those as well. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, Chair Lady. Appreciate your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you and now we recognize the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, Chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Investigation, Oversight, and Regulations. Thank you. Um, I, I was certainly alarmed to see that uh, women, especially African Americans and Hispanics, obtain patents at lower rates than men. That um, uh, people of color obtain patents at much lower rates than whites, that individuals from lower income backgrounds are much less likely to obtain a patent than children of wealthier families. And yet, I know as uh, chair of the uh, co-chair of the Congressional Creative Rights Caucus how important intellectual property and IP protections impact our economy. These are these protections are especially important for my district in Southern California, which is home to countless of these small business owners and innovators who hold IP in a wide variety of fields from technology to art, music, and movies. And so I really feel strongly that as members of Congress, we have a responsibility to foster their innovation and ensure that the U.S. is an environment where ingen uh, ingenuity and inventiveness can thrive and prosper. Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, robust and thorough demographic data to understand how we can ensure the patent system is working for traditionally underserved communities like minorities, women, and veterans. And it means that we need, need more data and better cooperation between federal agencies, including the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Ms. Griffin, you, you have such an powerful story about how patents changed your life you testify to how patents can unlock generational wealth. Can you expound on that statement and explain why patents are a powerful tool in reducing economic inequality and why it's so important that historically disadvantaged Americans can fully benefit from patent protections for their intellectual property? 
Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about patents, um, we talk about generational wealth, right, and how intellectual property is equitable to ownership, which is also equitable to generational wealth. And so if we are to own patents, then what does that do for our economy, for our marginalized communities, um, for our historically black college universities? Um, if they are to actually start playing in the tech transfer spaces and having um, return on investments from R&D funding um, by producing patents and then being able to exploit those by licensing, licensing those patents, creating spinoff companies um, specifically around those communities, um, utilizing the entrepreneurs within those universities who are also minorities to utilize those technologies, to improve on, this te on those technologies. It becomes this ecosystem um, in the cycle of event where you are now creating generational wealth across generations, um, specifically when we start talking about um, federal government, how can we actually be using HBCUs as a conduit to do this? And so even with SBIR funding, STTR funding, looking at um, non-traditional um, principal investigators who are in our marginalized communities, they may have, they may be small business owners who don't have a, a technical background, but what we see is in the startup space, you can actually be a non-technical CEO and then find a CTO to actually help you uh, push your company company forward. And so if we are to do that, then we could take small business owners with non-technical backgrounds, pair them with principal investigators at historically black college universities or minority serving institutions, and then create um, generational wealth through that way. Thank you for that. Uh, Missy Pilato, uh, my district in Southern California is home to uh, 744 independent small business inventors, and they've told me personal stories of the prohibitive costs associated not only with applying for uh, a patent, but also defending their intellectual property rights from sometimes frivolous legal challenges. In fact, they said that large companies are able to exploit the USPTO system to overwhelm independent inventors and small businesses with litigation and legal fees by endlessly challenging the validity of their patent. But I was struck about your case study of a female entrepreneur expecting to pay between four to $8,000 in filing and fees. And also, of course, she has childcare costs that limit her financial mm -hmm. resources. So how can the expectation of High filing legal fees dissuade some dissuade some innovators from engaging in the patent process, and how could this disproportionately affect minority and female entrepreneurs? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the example that you mentioned is Dr. Sarah Reyes. She recently obtained her doctoral degree at Cornell, and she has a countertop breast milk pasteurizer that she's currently going through the filing process right now. Um, she is a, about to be a postdoc where you don't make a lot of money, and thankfully she's in programs like Entrepreneurship Lab or eLab at Cornell, and we Cornell that provide her with a small stipend of money, $5,000 to help cover those costs. Um, but if you don't provide that funds to cover those legal fees and the, the patent fees itself, then folks like Dr. Reyes will be limited in even pursuing those patents. So providing these small stipends as part of on-ramp programs like We Cornell can help increase the number of women and my minorities that are applying for patents, or else it is just cost prohibitive and we're not going to see this increase. Thank you. I yield back. Time has expired. Mr. Evans from Pennsylvania, Vice Chair of the Committee, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as usual, I thank you, Madam Chair, and the ranking member for your leadership on these issues. This is really very important. Women and minorities are less likely to receive venture capital. In 2018, women entrepreneurs in tech brought in just 22 point percent in U.S. venture capital investment. Just 1% of venture-backed founders were African-Americans, and one8 were Hispanic. Further, nearly three-fourths of venture capital firms have no female investors. Minorities represent just 3% to 4% of venture capital. Now, this is a question to all of you, so you have your chance, since I only have 4 minutes and 16 seconds. To any of the witnesses, can you explain 
the disparity in venture capital expenditures and make suggestions on how we can increase the chances of women and minority in tech of receiving venture capital. So I go down the line and start with Mr. Wade. And Thanks, sir. That is a very important issue, capital. And one of the things we must understand is that invest, uh, investors are attracted to patents. Yes. And that is a very important variable in this conversation of access to capital. I also believe that uh, uh, mentor-protege uh, programs, how do we build the kinds of relationships uh, between venture capitalists and other funders uh, with innovators and entrepreneurs from uh, minority communities are very important. That's one of the initiatives, actually, that we're developing uh, through the U.S. Chamber. Ms. So I'd like to also comment on um, what he said, that um, I have the same sentiments. Um, but as I was doing my research, um, it says the first patent granted increases the probability of securing VC funding by 53%. Um, so it's very, very important that we get small business owners, specifically black women, to start actually monetizing their IP and actually patenting that intellectual property. Um, we're the most educated, um, the most entrepreneurial, and with that, we need to be. We need to also have the most patents as well. So yes, I'll just quickly say that that the collection of data becomes important by understanding what happened before the application, during the application, and after the application. So what the success uh, what the Success Act is aiming to do is commendable in the sense that essentially doing a longitudinal survey to ask people over time. That becomes extremely, extremely key to figure out where are the gaps in the pipeline? Where, is, where are the leaks in the pipeline? Right now, we simply only have data kind of on who's applying and who's not and whether or not they're awarded, awarded that. But the pipeline extends well beyond that and a collection of data will help better address these questions so that, uh, so that um, resources can then be allocated specifically to deal with social networks, to deal with a lack of capital. I mean, we already know for minority and women-owned businesses, they're simply less likely to get loans from banks. And a lot of that is systemic. These are things that can be made up. This prevents them from banging their work to scale. And that becomes extremely important for individuals who are low income in urban and rural areas because research shows that they are more likely to return to where they're from. This means they are helping to generate jobs in rural areas, urban areas, low income areas that previously didn't have any. I want to agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, so we know that venture capitalists are overwhelmingly white males. And if you talk to any venture capitalist, they say how they get to know entrepreneurs is through introductions. So if you're not embedded in these networks, then you can't get an introduction to venture capitalists, and then you can't raise funding. And we know um, that getting a patent helps get venture funding. So that's one point. Secondly, a lot of the process of pitching and getting Getting investment from venture capitalists, frankly, has been optimized for men. An example of this is a study by Dr. Murray, where she looked at both male and female entrepreneurs, and she recorded their voice with the exact same content. And it was found that men were seen as a more attractive investment. They even added video, and of course, they saw the same thing. But as you can see, that it has been optimized for men to receive this funding overall. I thank you. And Madam Chair, I hope uh, with the question that I just asked, yes, protecting patents are important and what we need to do, but at the end of the day, if you're going to move these patents to be commercialized to the marketplace and try to address the problems in communities, as the basis of it, they need capital. They need access. So you, I know, have been conducting sessions with tech fins and other entities, but that really needs to be a discussion as a follow. -up. So I just only suggest that in your thinking about that. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Maine, uh, Mr. Golden, chairman of the subcommittee on contracting on infrastructure for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to ask a question I don't know the answer to already. So it's, uh, you know, hopefully uh, it's one out of curiosity, but it's specific to uh, some of my constituents in Maine. Uh, Maine is, a, a, I think, per capita, uh, one of the least diverse, uh, whitest states that we have in, in the country, very large, very rural. 
Uh, but in, in the last couple of decades, we've had a sizable uh, group of Somali Americans move into the, the community, uh, as well as uh, a, a fair uh, number of asylum seekers. And I've found that because of language barriers, uh, for the first generation anyway, what we often see is, is a lot of people that become small business owners. Uh, they bring a lot of skills with them. The language barrier kind of stands in, in the way, though. Uh, and as a result, it's hard for them to get into whatever industries we, we have in, in that area. And so they are very creative in how they find a way to, to make things work and, and make a living, uh, become entrepreneurs them, themselves, but something that we often see uh, particularly with very technical issues or having to deal with the bureaucracy of, of agencies like SBA is that language barrier can be very frustrating and or prevent them from accessing the kind of assistance that they need to really maximize uh, their skills and, and become successful. So I was just curious, w particularly with patent uh, at USPTO, do, are, is there good resources there to help people overcome uh, language barriers um, or, or is that lacking? And, and if it is lacking, any recommendations on where people can go to get help with, with that kind of a challenge? Not to my knowledge. I don't know of any resources off the top of my head. I, I don't as well, but I'd like to just make one observation of the, uh, the advantage of that language also. What we do know is that minority firms uh, own enterprises are more likely to export, mm -hmm. to do business uh, in countries abroad. I agree. Wholeheartedly. And so how we also view language barriers could also be a language opportunity uh, in not just a patent process, but as we seek to grow uh, more entrepreneurs, uh, particularly who are exporting their uh, products abroad. I just want to make one, one quick point that speaks to this. So when I did my analysis of patents over time with, with the data that we have available, one big thing we know is that uh, U.S. patent recipients has decreased over time and, and foreign recipients has increased. And, and a large percentage are, is coming from Asia, in particular um, Japan. But one of the things that I, know, that I was thinking about as it relates to demographic information as a university professor, we have a lot of individuals, a lot of international students who come, but they might actually return or a lot of them might actually want to stay and they're being innovative while they're here. However, we're not collecting information to know whether or not they're even educated in, in the United States to begin with. So when we look at the demographic information currently, we see that they're listed under a foreign inventor, when in fact they might have invented that at a U.S. university and then they might actually, actually need ways to think about scaling it to, to help the U.S. economy grow. And I think that that is something that's missing. So it speaks to language in the sense that a lot of international students come over, there is a language barrier. They are learning um, English in a lot of ways, but they are being innovative. And we need to actually capture information on them to figure out how they're contributing to the U.S. economy as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I agree wholeheartedly. It's, it's a huge potential asset in our community uh, where we can see increased economic relations. Uh, that we, we wouldn't have had any, and, you know, w w without our Somali Americans. So uh, I'm not surprised that maybe you don't have an answer or, or, or um, you know, that you don't think there's any resources like that out there. But I just, something to point out, Madam uh, Chair, I mean, I've had meetings with SBA uh, where it was a point of frustration for people that uh, there's no one to help translate, no one that can help uh, deal with some of the language barrier. And, and I'm, of course, thinking most specifically about that first generation of, of immigrants who uh, often have a, a, a lot of great ideas and are running businesses. And when they come to the federal government for help, um, it's tough if, if there's uh, you know, no resources out there to, to help with, with uh, translation. It has been a challenging uh, aspect of our relation with uh, the SBA, but we will continue to press upon because if there is anything, immigrants is the entrepreneurial spirit of the immigrant community and how many businesses are created. So that's a way to grow our economy and, uh, and we have to do a better job. With that, let me thank all the witnesses and um, 
Uh, I just would like to make a closing statement. Uh, the U.S. patent system provides inventors and small businesses the ability to monetize life-changing ideas and incentivizes advancement in technology. Because of its vital role in protecting val valuable intellectual property, a strong and inclusive patent system is necessary to advance America's economic growth and global competitiveness. However, we have far to go in this journey. Women, minorities, and low-income communities in urban and rural America are still underrepresented in the patent, trademark, and innovation ecosystem. Gathering information about patent applicant demographics will drive better policy that ultimately helps more women, people of color, moderate and low-income communities, and other traditionally disadvantaged groups obtain patents for their innovations. Closing the patent gap will also drive economic growth and advance America's global lead in innovation. I look forward to working with my colleagues in Congress to advance policies that foster an inclusive innovation ecosystem. I will ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statement and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so order. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.